I want to turn to the connection between galaxy evolution and active galactic nuclei, which we sort of talked about last time, quasars. So an active galaxy is just any galaxy that produces a very high amount of energy at its center, so from its nucleus. So we would just say these are high luminosity galaxies and quasars were one example that had thousands of times the luminosity of a normal galaxy. Um, but there are other types of active galactic nuclei. So all of them work based on the same kind of uh, central engine where there's a supermassive black hole that accretes matter. And that's the source of the very high luminosity. But the various types of active galaxies vary based on how much radiation they produce and how many particles they emit. So there are examples called radio galaxies, where we see most of the luminosity in the form of radio waves. Um, there's a kind called blazars, which is when, um, if you kind of think of this as a, I don't know, a disc on a stick, a blazar is when we're looking straight down at one of those particle jets. And uh, that jet is therefore blue shifted to extremely high energies. Um, and we see it with very high travel speeds. So that's a pretty cool one. And then a Seifert galaxy is just any active galactic nucleus that doesn't have these jets. So we would expect, you know, maybe they've already settled down. So when we look at the masses of the black holes that power active galaxies, we notice that the black hole masses correlate with the mass of the central bulge of the galaxy. This image is a little bit confusing because it shows kind of both a um, elliptical and a spiral together to try to make the point that these could be elliptical or spiral galaxies. So my question for you in the chat is, take a minute and tell me what sorts of processes could lead to a black hole's mass growing larger. All right, definitely. So maybe black holes can themselves merge together. They could gain mass as they eat the mass from their accretion disk. Um, other objects could also merge with the black hole, like neutron stars or other stellar remnants, or even just stars. Um, yeah, so pretty straightforward. So mergers create um, more massive black holes. So I guess it makes sense that if there's more stuff in the central bulge of a galaxy, the black hole has the opportunity to amass more and more mass. But the reason that it has this particular linear relationship and that it like we can actually measure this relationship and the black hole mass tends to be one two hundredth of the mass of the overall galaxy that specific detail is, we don't know why it's that particular number okay so thinking about galaxy evolution um, do you think that galaxy collisions were more frequent in the past or more frequent today all right i see most votes for a that's exactly right maybe it's because you already saw that one no so yeah, we expect that galaxies, galaxy collisions were more common, right? That's the underpinning of this entire merger model. Um, for one thing, there were just more galaxies then, and they were packed into less space because space has been expanding this whole time, right? Um, but as you have fewer and fewer larger galaxies, the collisions become less and less likely. And this is a, another hint that our merger model is actually um, accurate, is the, the the quasar evolution mirrors this idea. So remember, we saw that quasars um, are easier to find in the universe's past. So, you know, a few billion years after the Big Bang, that's when we saw the most quasars. And then the number of quasars declines to the present day. And similarly, the rate of star formation was also much higher in the universe's past than it is today. And both, both of these things together um, imply something important. So why do you think that star formation and quasar numbers would be related? Yeah, there was just more stuff around then. Less of the gas, when, when quasars were very um, populous, star formation rates are high because there just hadn't been a lot of time to turn all the raw dust and gas into stars, right? But over time, more and more of that gas gets taken up into stars so the star formation rate decreases. Also, the star formation is happening in these young galaxies and the, um, the quasars have lots to feed on at this time, lots of gas, lots of dust, and 
they're in these um, very young galaxies that are um, colliding at a very high rate, right? So lots of galaxy collision, the galaxies that are colliding are forming lots of stars, and therefore the quasar activity is very high at the same time that the star formation rate is very high. All right, so here's an example of a bunch of different quasars, and these often also have multiple cores, right? So a lot of quasars are in these colliding systems and this can bring the black holes new fuel and cause them to become active. And you know, other galaxies can become active even if they're not currently active, if new fuel is brought into the vicinity of their black hole. Um, yeah, where does the fuel burn in an active galactic nucleus? Yeah, I see most votes for A. Um, all of that fuel is burning in the accretion disk. So it's in the accretion disk where the matter is rubbing together, getting hot and glowing. So all of the fuel in the accretion disk doesn't stay there forever. So over time, that'll become incorporated into the mass of the black hole, just like you said in the chat question a little bit ago. And so over time, you have less fuel um, because there's less and less of this raw material to eat and also less and less galaxy collisions happening. So over time, we see fewer quasars and fewer active galaxies. But there are some active galaxies that are relatively nearby. And it's possible, actually, that the Milky Way was active um, not too, too long ago. There's evidence called the Fermi bubbles that your textbook talks about um, that are probably um, structures that were created when the Milky Way was active. OK. Something else that's really awesome about active galactic nuclei is we've seen some galaxies that have multiple supermassive black holes in them. So based on what you now know about galaxy evolution, what sorts of galaxies do you suppose we'd find multiple black holes within? All right, so if you said B or C or D, you're correct. Um, it could be elliptical or irregular galaxies. We could expect multiple supermassive black holes within ellipticals where they haven't quite um, joined each other yet. Um, but irregular galaxies are probably currently undergoing collision. And so we could find multiple supermassive black holes in irregulars and they haven't yet had time to settle into ellipticals. And we actually do see this. So um, this is NGC 6240. It has two black holes in it. And these black holes are merging with each other and in about 400 million years, they will merge with each other. We've actually detected black hole mergers uh, in the LIGO experiment. So we know that this happens. And I've told you about LIGO before. This is another reason why it's really important because it can tell us more about galaxy evolution. If we see that two supermassive black holes have just merged, then we would really like to know what it is that the galaxy looks like at that time. So this is the idea of multi-messenger astronomy. When we see such an event, we can then point our telescopes in other wavelength ranges toward that area of the sky to learn more about what just happened. Okay, the last couple minutes here, I wanna talk about some of the ways that, um, that an active nucleus can change the star formation rates within galaxies. So you've got all kinds of stuff happening in your active galactic nucleus. You've got your jets, your particles, radiation from the accretion disk, and all these things can impact star formation in both ways. They can increase it and decrease it. So if you have the situation where you have cool gas clouds that are compressed by some of the um, winds from your galactic nucleus, then those gas clouds can collapse and form new stars. So you can have an increase in star formation when your galaxy comes active. But also if it heats up the gas clouds, then star formation cannot happen. Stars only form from cold gas, not from hot gas. And so you would get less star formation from the radiation from the accretion disk. So there's kind of these multiple competing factors. And as you saw, there's some starburst that happens when the gas um, merges together in colliding galaxies. But then after that galaxy you know, becomes active, it's not clear exactly which way this would go. And both of these are an influence um, on the overall development of that galaxy after collision. 